Hi folks, thanks for joining us. Um, we're just gonna give a few more minutes since I'm always running late and I know I appreciate when, when other people give me that. Um, so we'll get started in just uh, a moment. Um, everyone is currently muted. Uh, if you have questions or comments during this program, you can enter them in the chat. Oh, hello, Suzanne. Thank you for greeting everybody. Um, so everyone is aware we are recording this presentation so that way we can share it in the future with others. Um, it will be posted onto our uh, Audubon Southwest YouTube page. Um, and we will have a chance to do a lot of Q&A, especially because we have kind of a small group tonight. So it'll be a great opportunity to have some good conversation. So we'll get started in, in just a moment. All right, so it looks like we don't have anybody else in the waiting room, so we're just going to jump right in. Oh, we do have one person. Uh, good evening. My name is Katie Weeks. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm the Director of Community Education for Audubon Southwest. I am normally based out of the Randall Davy Audubon Center in Santa Fe when we have offices. Um, if you ever get a chance to come and visit, I hope you do. We've got some wonderful trails. Um, tonight is our second installation of our spring webinar series. And it um, should be a really interesting uh, presentation from our fearless leader, John Hayes. Just as we get started um, with some housekeeping and Zoom basics, I know we're a year into Zoom and I feel like I live on Zoom, but I know that's not true for everyone. So this is theoretically what your screen looks like. It might vary from computer to computer. Um, as a courtesy to everyone, we just are gonna have everyone stay on mute just because Zoom doesn't do well with multiple conversations. We do have the chat box open. So if you have comments or questions, feel free to enter those into there and I'll be monitoring it throughout the presentation. Um, everyone has their videos off. I think you might have the option to turn it on, but I find that it helps with uh, buffering and our internet connectivity, which we know can be a little bit uh, variable in New Mexico sometimes. So keeping that off will definitely help your connection. Um, and we do have the ability for closed captioning tonight. If you um, would like that and it's helpful there, you can see down in the bottom right of your toolbar, there's a button that has the CC live transcript. Uh, if you prefer to not have the uh, running words on the bottom of your screen, you can also opt to turn them off through that function. And just a quick plug about what's coming up in our um, the rest of our series this spring. We've got a bunch of really great opportunities to learn about Audubon's programs. Um, next week for Earth Day, we have a really cool um, presentation from our Director of Bird Conservation. Tice is going to talk about climate change and its impact on birds in the Southwest and Audubon's report that came out a few years ago that was a pretty jarring about the impact of um, climate change on birds, but uh, we'll give some solutions and not make it too much of a downer, some action items for Earth Day. Later in May, we're gonna have a great presentation from Paul, who is Mr. Rio Grande himself, talking about conservation of the Rio Grande, and maybe it won't be so grande for so long. Um, and then we're gonna have an opportunity for advocacy training with our policy director, Judy. Um, and then we'll start, kick off our summer with a really cool partnership with Steve, um, out of our Arizona office talking about a brewery program that's helping to connect birds, brewers, water, and the public. So those should be really great. Uh, to, in order to stay connected about these and other upcoming programs, you can follow us on social media um, under our tag Audubon Southwest. We also have an e-newsletter that goes out um, and I can put that in the chat for us. And you can sign up to learn more about our programs, opportunities to connect. Um, we're gonna be starting some conservation work days and other hands-on opportunities. Um, so feel free to sign up with that. 
um, to connect with all of our different programs that's happening. I'm also just going to make a quick plug that we are um, offering this program tonight free of charge. Um, we rely, as a nonprofit, we rely on grants and donations. Um, and we know it's been a tough year for, for all of us. Um, but if you are able to give, we do appreciate anything that you can contribute. It helps to um, support our conservation work in Arizona, New Mexico, and environmental education opportunities for young and old alike. So I'll also throw the, the donation link in the chat in just a moment. Um, and we do appreciate any amount that you're able to give. I have to make sure I got the right link and I didn't just give you guys two of the same thing. So for tonight's main event, we've got um, our executive director, John Hayes. Um, this is a, a pre-pandemic photo, as you might guess. <laughs> it's a little bit, looks a little bit different. Um, but so John is our executive director of uh, Audubon Southwest, which includes both New Mexico and Arizona. Um, he, John has a strong conservation experience through his professional um, experience at multiple levels in public service. Over the last decade, John has built strong partnerships between public and private organizations to provide scalable conservation outcomes across multiple types of ecosystems. He has specifically focused on meaningful programs that conserve native bird species and the habitats they rely on. Before joining Audubon, um, John worked for the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and the Great Plains Landscape Conservation Cooperative, where he did a bunch of different research projects and coordinated um, implementation of conservation work. He has worked for federal agencies, worked with state wildlife agencies, and um, coordinated between nonprofit organizations, um, all focused on Western grasslands and uh, riparian ecosystems. So he's got, he's going to tell us some stories and it'll come up in his presentation as well. Um, so I won't keep going too much into it, but uh, it is a great opportunity for us to learn about a really interesting and innovative program tonight. So with that, John, I will let you take it away. Thanks, Katie. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Let's see. Um, let's see here. Okay, are we good, Katie? Are you seeing it? Yes. Okay. Okay. Hey, everybody. Uh, it's great to have uh, you folks join us tonight. It's a it's a relatively small group, uh, and so I think there will be some some time for discussion at the end. Uh, and I hope you guys uh, take us up on that. Um, you know, we know that, uh, you know, the conversation around uh, grazing and livestock, uh, the livestock industry and conservation is one that can be a little um, somewhat controversial at times for uh, bird conservationists and for environmentalists in general. And, uh, and so, you know, we, we want to make sure we leave time open for um, some dialogue and to, to talk through some of this. Um, uh, I've spent most of my career as the Katie gave a long bio there, but what you guys need to know is um, I've, I've by and large committed my conservation work to um, really looking at the grassland landscape, the Great Plains in general, uh, and trying to find ways where we can uh, make uh, both the uh, industries that we rely on for food, fiber, and fuel in this country uh, able to um, sustain alongside uh, grass and bird populations and other wildlife in these landscapes. And so um, this is an area that's uh, near and dear to my heart. I'll probably they'll come across a bit in this in this conversation, but um, it's also an area I know there's a lot of differing opinions and a lot of um, critical thoughts needed. So, so we invite uh, some conversation after this. But what you guys are going to get tonight is uh, a crash course, all right? Um, we're going to talk some science. Um, we're going to talk about uh, uh, what's happening with birds in the Great Plains landscape and in our southwestern grasslands. 
We're going to talk about how grasslands function, what a grassland is when we when we use that word, um, how we manage those those landscapes for the benefit of uh, both uh, uh, the livestock industry, but also uh, the wildlife habitat that it provides. And then a really unique approach that Audubon's taken called our conservation ranching program, or some people will call it bird friendly beef, which we'll we'll talk about. And then we'll talk touch a little bit about what else is going on in the bigger picture with grassland conservation in the US. So let's start here though. Uh, and I'm gonna get the doom and gloom out of the way because one of the things that uh, folks in the environmental conservation community are quite often uh, 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 charged with is that we uh, give too much doom and gloom and too much bad news. And so I'm gonna get some of that out of the way and we're gonna spend the rest of the time being hopeful. Um, but what I wanna show here is this uh, the results from a report uh, that came out in 2019 that got pretty, pretty widespread publicity. So you might've seen this, uh, but Basically, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology analyzed uh, close to 50 years of breeding bird survey data. This is a, a survey that's been going on across the nation for since 1965 was the first year um, uh, where uh, uh, talented and skilled bird observers uh, go out and they drive a 25 mile route, stop every half mile uh, and count the birds they see. Uh, and so it's one of the longest, most um, uh, uh, you know, continuous and um, largest data sets we have looking at bird populations. And from that, we were able to say that uh, 3 billion birds, are, the bird abundance, the sheer number of birds in the US has declined by 3 billion in just 50 years. It's scary stuff. It's even scarier in certain areas that felt this decline more heavily. And based on the talk tonight, you can probably guess that one of those areas where these losses have been concentrated have been in the grasslands um, on the Great Plains of the United States. So in the grasslands alone have, have lost uh, uh, 720 million of those, those 3 billion birds. So close to a quarter of that bird loss has happened in the grasslands. And if you look at just that, those birds that live there, uh, we've lost about half of them, about 53% of the number of birds. So if you can imagine driving across the prairie, either in Eastern New Mexico or Kansas, Nebraska, Oklahoma, wherever you live, um, uh, even in, in Arizona and in um, some of those Sonoran and, and arid land grasslands, uh, uh, you, you could expect to 100 years ago have seen twice as many birds as you see now. A bird like an eastern meadowlark, which is still a common bird in the U.S., has declined by 75%. Uh, its cousin in our neck of the woods, the western meadowlark, uh, numbers are right about that too. Uh, and so that's a, a bird that we all know and love is kind of iconic of the prairie is in pretty deep decline. So one of the things I like to do with these talks is to dive a step further than this to show you some individual birds and some of my favorites actually. Um, so the grasshopper sparrow, uh, diminutive little sparrow bird, one of these little, little brown birds that we talk about. It's not called the grasshopper sparrow because it eats grasshoppers or because it's the size of a grasshopper, but actually because of its uh, song. It's this long trill that I'm not gonna try to imitate, uh, but it's iconic of, of uh, open prairie, uh, wide open country. And, and I'd encourage you to learn that sound because next time you're out in the prairie, you might uh, be able to pick it up. But here's what the population of grasshopper sparrows have done uh, over the last 50 years. This is the same data set that uh, I showed that um, uh, uh, the 3 billion birds lost report uh, uh, used. That's a pretty scary uh, population decline. This used to be one of the more abundant birds you would see on one of those breeding bird survey uh, uh, routes, and, uh, and it's just not, not, a, a, not that often we're seeing them anymore. Another one, a lark bunting. For those of you in New Mexico, this might be a bird you've seen in our grasslands. It might not. Um, the lark bunting uh, uses eastern New Mexico primarily as a migratory flyway, although we do know that they breed in northeastern New Mexico, southeastern Colorado. It's actually sort of a population hotspot for them and their breeding grounds. Um, and then they winter. Uh, likely some of those birds are wintering in southern New Mexico uh, as well and in southern Texas. Uh, the, when they're in their wintering grounds, they lose this, uh, even the males lose this striking black and white coloration, and they look a little bit more like a, a brown, uh, uh, another sparrow, uh, although a little bigger. Uh, the population of lark buntings are uh, what we call eruptive uh, in that they have these big boom bust cycles that go up and down. But if you look at that population chart, uh, the, the consistent story has been a decline, uh, even with those annual variations. Another, the mountain plover. This is one that folks 
uh, quite often are surprised to see out on the out on the prairie. This is a bird that, in particular, doesn't actually live in the mountains, but it lives is right up next to the mountains. Uh, quite often, the the front range of Colorado is a pretty popular spot, um, right in the grasslands that that butt up to the the mountain ranges. Um, mountain plovers are, you know, they're a plover. They're a shorebird. For those of you that know know birds, we think of them more like, um, uh, you know, sandpipers and running along the beach and that that type of situation. Uh, but this mountain, this bird uh, loves real short short grass, um, disturbed areas. Uh, quite often, you'll see them in in recently burned areas or um, uh, even in a pen where they keep uh, intense numbers of cattle. Uh, no, a bird that's less common but no less, uh, showing no less uh, of a severe decline. And once again, a, a pretty scary one as well. And then the last one of these depressing charts I'll show you is the chestnut collared long spur. Uh, and I'm gonna spend a little extra time on this because this is a bird that's uh, of particular concern right now. Uh, long spurs, chestnut collared, and their cousin, the thick-billed long spur, formerly the McCown's long spur, are one of our fastest declining birds in North America. Uh, here's what that, that chart looks like and what that decline looks like. It's a little flashier than most of your other, uh, you know, sparrow related species. I like this picture because you can actually see its namesake long spur on that bottom toe there on the, uh, the branch that it's uh, hanging on to. Um, uh, it's a pretty colorful bird for the prairie. So especially the male when they're in their breeding plumage, you can see that chestnut collar. Uh, and if you're out, you'll, you can likely pick it out. Uh, if you see one of these birds, you probably, especially in the wintering grounds, probably see a lot of them because they tend to flock up in mixed flocks of, of long spurs, sometimes hundreds of birds um, uh, thick in those flocks. So uh, what's going on with the long spur? Well, the declines are, are pretty disturbing to us. Both the chestnut collared and the thick billed, which is that bird shown on the right, have declined by 85% and 86% in the past 50 years. That's a decline of about 5% every year. And that means that population, the whole population of North America is gonna half again uh, in right around 20 years. Uh, we're losing their habitat both in the breeding grounds and the wintering grounds. And so they're getting it from both sides. And there's a number of us that are pretty concerned if we don't do something about this pretty soon. Uh, in, our, in my career, we might be talking about the extinction of this bird on this landscape. Uh, what's that landscape look like? Here's an area, here's an idea of where these birds spend their time. Uh, that chestnut collared uh, uh, is a, a bird that uh, spends quite a bit of its, uh, quite a few of those birds spend their winter in New Mexico and in West Texas and in uh, Northern Mexico. Uh, much of that area where both these birds are overwintering uh, is what's considered Chihuahuan Desert Grassland. And so it's a grassland, but a little drier than the, we think of like the Great Plains, or we think of Kansas and the rolling green hills. Um, this is a little more deserty, but there's definitely a grass component um, and it's, uh, it's grazing land and, and rangeland as well. So what's happening on the Chihuahuan Desert Grassland? Well, it's just one example of the way we treat these areas, quite honestly. Uh, this is a, a, a picture from just this past year um, down in southern New Mexico, where one of our uh, biologists was doing bird surveys. And this gives you an idea of what we call the range condition in an area. And now, just so you know, this isn't naturally what this place is supposed to look like. Although it's dry and, and somewhat uh, deserty, uh, you should still have some of these shorter strat stature grasses like um, uh, the grama, black grama, blue grama, um, tabosa grass, uh, sand drop seed, some of these um, uh, really dry sandy soil uh, adapted species. But what we've seen here is we've seen some pretty significant grazing followed by years of drought, which are becoming more and more common. And what results is almost no standing grass uh, that these birds need. I'll get to why these birds need that grass in a little bit. But the added stress that we're seeing in the Chihuahuan Desert grasslands in particular, and could be um, uh, is, is similar in other, other landscapes as well, is the uh, uh, impact of a number of different types of development. So we've seen soil loss and desertification from historic uh, overgrazing. Uh, in some places, we've lost over three feet of topsoil as a result. But we also see mineral extraction. In the Chihuahuan Desert grasslands in particular, uh, that's where the Permian Basin is. Uh, much of it's made up of the Permian Basin. And this is a picture on the left of um, uh, well pads in the, in the Permian. Um, uh, when we do that to a landscape, when we turn it into an industrial zone, uh, it's no longer bird habitat. And I'll explain for, in a little bit why, uh, but it's, it's, I, I think it's a pretty important uh, thing to know. This picture on the right is uh, a USGS survey marker. 
And if any of you guys have been outside before and, and out in the uh, public lands, you'll see these things. And when they hammer them in 50 years ago, 100 years ago, this one's from 1940, um, they do them flush with the ground. So that thing's supposed to be all the way in the ground. So that shows you in the last 50 years how much topsoil has been lost from that area. Absolutely remarkable and, and pretty terrifying. So when we do this to these landscapes, obviously the birds suffer. And from those, those uh, uh, chestnut colored long spur uh, uh, decline, I, I hopefully you see that. But I don't wanna be all doom and gloom. There is hope. And that's where we'll, we'll get to in this, this uh, talk and this conversation. And in this case, hope actually looks like a duck, all right? So uh, in the 1980s, uh, we were facing a similar situation with waterfowl populations in North America at an all time low. 1985 is known as the year where the bottom fell out of the, uh, the duck populations. And obviously they have a strong constituency in the, in the waterfowl hunters out there. And uh, they, they um, uh, raised a ruckus and, uh, uh, and we did something about it. We responded. So, uh, in, 19, in, the, in the mid to late 80s, uh, we passed the uh, North American Waterfowl Conservation Act and the North American Waterfowl Management Plan. Um, both of these things were designed to bring together agencies to um, our federal agencies to the, bring the full weight of the federal government to the conservation of these birds. We protected wetlands um, and we penalized wetland destruction. And so um, if you ever have been involved in a construction project or even work on a ranch, you know, you sometimes have to avoid uh, federally recognized wetlands. This is why that's the case. Um, we had lost a ton and that was what was driving the decline. Um, we invested in habitat restoration, so we made new wetlands. And this is really where you know, a group like Ducks Unlimited has excelled, in the, whether it's in the Texas Gulf Coast or Louisiana or the Prairie Pothole region in North Dakota or Canada. Um, we've put wetlands in uh, at a pretty impressive rate. Uh, we also created joint ventures, which is partnerships of uh, private uh, uh, and uh, public uh, organizations and agencies. Uh, and uh, in, in a lot of, in most cases, we've restored those waterfowl populations. So here's what those populations look like. These are the same uh, uh, time spans that I showed those other more depressing ones of the grassland birds. So you see that uh, uh, not only have some of these populations gone up, um, but they did so almost, uh, almost immediately after we started really investing in, in the work. Now there are exceptions and in Northern Pintail is one of them, this bird here on the lower right, that population has continued to decline and it's something that's scary for us, but it's actually in this case, for this conversation, it's almost the, um, uh, the, uh, the exception that, that proves the rule. And that Northern Pintail, uh, what they really need for their nesting habitat is prairie, is grassland. They need tall grass prairie to nest in. That's where they, that's their nesting uh, place of choice. So we've restored the wetlands, but in this case, we might not have restored everything that that bird needs um, because we failed to really protect and, and restore these grasslands that, that um, this and some of these other birds are, are dependent on. So we can do this. We know we can do this, but first we got to learn a little bit about how grasslands work. So here's the science. So if you uh, uh, didn't like your uh, high school biology class, hopefully I can win you over because this is the stuff I love to talk about. Uh, and I'll try not to talk too fast and we'll keep it at a somewhat high level because I don't uh, wanna uh, bore anybody on a Tuesday night with a science lesson, but I think it's pretty neat stuff. So hopefully you guys will bear with me. And we're gonna start at the beginning, the more, most basic. Why do we have grasslands? Why are some areas prairie? Why are some areas forest? Why are some areas desert? Well, all of those have different answers, but with grasslands, the primary driver is this concept of the rain shadow. Okay, pretty simple idea. If you took a geoscience class in junior high, you might've learned this or, or any geography class really. Basically the idea is our dominant winds come from the West, bringing warm, moist air full of water off of the oceans. As they come into the continent, they hit mountain ranges, whether it's the Sierra Nevadas or the Rockies or, or any, um, and this is on all continents. They hit mountain ranges that force that air up in elevation to cooler altitudes. When it gets that cold air, that cold temperature, that air mass, uh, the, the uh, water vapor in that air mass condenses, drops in the form of rain or, or snow at higher altitudes on the western slope or at those high peaks. And what's left is 
a dry, warm air mass to uh, uh, move down the, the leeward side of those mountains. Uh, the other thing that happens uh, as a result of this is uh, you have increased uh, uh, wind speeds on that on the, the, the dry side of these mountains uh, because it's just simple physics when you force an air mass or any mass through a smaller opening, which in this case the top of the peaks and the, the bottom of the atmosphere, it, as you as you push them through that more narrow opening, the speed of that wind speed uh, uh, increases. So basically what you've got is sort of a natural, almost like a, a, a hair dryer, you know, warm, hot air blowing constantly across these prairies. So it results, can you imagine what happens when you have warm, dry conditions? Well, you have fire, right? Uh, now, this is so, an area where there's a ton of research and a ton of learning yet to do, but we've learned a lot in the last couple of decades. One of the things we always used to think was that fire was driven by lightning strikes. Okay? If wildfire, you know, primarily we would assume that if there was a wildfire that wasn't human set, um, it was it was a lightning strike, and we we chalked a lot of the historic fire regime up to that. As fire ecologists have dug deeper and started asking harder questions, they found that the tree rings that they analyzed don't actually line up with the incidence of lightning caused wildfire. There's a gap there. There's more fire than there is lightning, basically, based on the research. And so what they've come to realize is that um, the, uh, uh, the indigenous uh, nations that were in the, on the plains well before the Europeans came had adopted uh, uh, cultural and um, uh, traditional practices of lighting fire for a variety of reasons, whether it was moving game, whether it was doing habitat restoration themselves, because they knew that the, the new regrowth was um, something that uh, buffalo and other grazing animals love to go graze on. Uh, they even did it to, to um, you know, impact each other, you know, the warring uh, uh, tribes and nations. So whether it was, you know, Apache or Kiowa, um, uh, Hickory, uh, uh, you know, a, a ton, um, uh, Pawnee, a ton of the indigenous tribes have been known to uh, to use fire as a tool. So the the uh, this landscape was perfectly set up uh, for that the use of that tool because you're just full of dry, warm air and and grass. So what happens when you light a grass on a fire or anything on fire? Uh, well. In, uh, uh, in ecology, one of the concepts we learn about early on is succession. And this is a, a process that can happen uh, in any landscape, any ecosystem. It's basically the step-by-step -step things we see happen on a piece of dirt after it's been disturbed. And it's pretty predictable, right? First thing that comes up are annual plants, those plants that grow from a seed. And then we have perennial plants come in, shrubs, softwood and hardwood trees. But one of the things we see during that process is we move from a highly diverse, highly productive, fast growing, early successional stage to a stage where a lot of those resources are locked up in the trees, locked up in the standing organic matter, and you don't have as much um, uh, primary productivity. You also don't have as much diversity of species because you have uh, bigger uh, species sort of take over and get established. So, uh, well, let me go back. So um, uh, uh, what we see in the, the grasslands is we see a, a system that's constantly disturbed because we have that rain shadow effect that keeps them dry and warm. And so fire is a common thing that's keeping them on the low end of this, of this curve. Now to adapt to that constant disturbance, plants, uh, uh, what, what we've seen is the uh, preference for perennial grasses in that landscape. So instead of a grass that's going to grow from a seed in its in its first year, uh, these perennial grasses are long lived. They're um, uh, old growth. Uh, you can have you know a, a, a switchgrass or a big blue stem that's decades old. We don't necessarily think of grass as old growth, but it can be. And they put down these incredible root masses. This diagram on the right shows a comparison of Kentucky bluegrass, like a common yard grass, and it's its um, uh, soil profile and its, its root system compared to the native prairie grasses and, and forbs. And what you see is, uh, is, is a pretty incredible collection of uh, organic matter under the soil that allows that grass uh, to store nutrients, also to uptake nutrients from uh, a, a great depth uh, and be able to uh, quickly grow after a disturbance. And so these are these perennial grasses are specifically evolved to be able to adapt to that uh, constant disturbance. Also with this huge root mass, 
you have a great ability to uptake water. So these, these are very drought resistant and they're just arid landscape resistant. They have another uh, evolutionary mechanism and this is where it gets really sciencey. So I will spare you, but um, just give you the high level uh, uh, takeaway that during or, or after the last ice age, when much of these grasses evolved in this landscape, they evolved a particular chemical pathway for their photosynthesis called C4 photosynthesis. And basically all that means is the part of the Calvin cycle, the metabolism of the plant uh, that releases the most water uh, is actually done in a layer of cells removed from the surface. And so less water is lost to evaporation and these plants are able to retain more. Uh, C4 grasses are often called warm season grasses because they're adapted to do uh, better than other grasses in these warm seasons and they're drought tolerant as well. So the result of this you know, rain shadow and these other factors in, of, of evolution uh, have been a sea of grass uh, you know, that stretches from you know, more to Kansas City to, to Denver, right? And north and south, all the way up Canada, down into Mexico, here in New Mexico, uh, and, uh, and patches uh, in, the, in, the, in the Intermountain West. We see high productivity, high diversity because of that succession. Uh, it's responsive to intermittent disturbance. It does well with disturbance. In fact, it, in fact, it needs it. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Highly drought tolerant, and there's high carbon storage. Uh, these grasslands actually have the ability to store more carbon in them than a big standing old growth forest uh, because of that huge root mass underground and the biotic uh, community that lives amongst it, all the microbes and things. So the carbon in the traditional prairie or the, the soil in the traditional prairie was high, high, high in carbon. And it, now it still retains a huge potential to, to uh, sequester carbon for us. And then enters this guy. So one of the challenges with a sea of grass is it's like water, water everywhere, not a drop to drink. Uh, you, we, uh, human beings, would die on a diet of nothing but grass. We can't metabolize it, but we know the, the ungulate, ungulate here, um, the ruminant gut of the, uh, of the Great Plains bison uh, and other uh, bovines, other cows, uh, have uh, evolved basically a fermentation tank that allows them to break down those grasses into uh, food they can use. Uh, so this guy was specialized on, if it was specialized for the Great Plains. So were these, pronghorn antelope, another, um, antelope's a misnomer, they're not actually an antelope, um, but uh, they do have a, a ruminant gut as well, and they've got a pretty effective uh, means of um, uh, digesting grass. And then even this guy, this, uh, the, the black-tailed prairie dog in this case, um, prairie dogs, we think of them are so small, they can't have the impact that bison do, but they're actually one of the, uh, the uh, as far as scale goes, one of the greatest grazers. Now, they, don't, they aren't a ruminant. They have a, um, uh, more like a horse. They have an extension off their intestines called a cecum that allows them to uh, digest uh, grasses. Uh, and then, obviously, we know that um, those uh, prairie dogs, in particular, serve as a keystone species for a grassland ecosystem. And they provide a food source for things like golden eagles and, and ferrets, and um, but also homes to rattlesnakes and burrowing owls. Burrowing owls are quite often, uh, 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 in some cases, obligates of, of uh, prairie dog colonies. They need those prairie dog colonies to survive, or that's one of the main things that they, they use to survive, both as a home and a source of food. So we know all these things are interacting, all these different uh, critters, the, the rain cycles, the fire, the grazing. Um, and then you have uh, a whole other layer that we often don't think about of invertebrates. Uh, the grasshoppers in this case, but there's all sorts of insects that are adapted to life on a specific type of plant or a specific species of plant. These, uh, I said that prairie dogs are often underestimated in their grazing ability. Grasshoppers by mass actually consume more grass in the Great Plains than any other um, uh, uh, grazer. And so these guys are uh, uh, one of the um, uh, most important pieces in that food chain because they feed all sorts of things like our loggerhead shrike, my favorite bird. Uh, this is a, a you know, predatory songbird, as we say. Um, they actually uh, uh, love to go find those grasshoppers, but also mice, small uh, 
uh, birds, um, uh, uh, small amphibians, lizard, those type of things. One of the things they do is they impale them on barbed wire because uh, they don't have the talon strength like other raptors do to eat them uh, uh, and hold them down. And they also might might do that for other reasons as well. Uh, but they depend on those, those grasshoppers out in that landscape. And so do birds like quail. Uh, our, our scale quail here, um, we often think of quail acting kind of like a chicken where they go around and they pick up seeds, um, but the young quail, and this is true across scale quail, bobwhite quail, Montezuma gambles, all of them, the young quail particularly need protein from insects. Uh, and so the, and that makes up about 90% of their diet. And so uh, they need an abundant grasshopper population. They need all those insects in those, uh, those grasslands uh, a lot. So how do we ensure that all that's working? How do we, as humans, take actions that can make sure that all those things are working together in harmony uh, and that we avoid those catastrophic losses we've been seeing at the last half century? Well, I like to quote my guy, Aldo Leopold here. Management uh, is a verb. And I, I think that's something that's really important for folks to recognize. If we back off and don't do anything on these rangelands or grasslands, uh, quite often they're gonna go uh, a bad direction and they're not gonna provide that habitat anymore because we've removed the fire and bison from them. So what we like to say is that game can be restored by the creative use of the same tools which have heretofore destroyed it. Axe, the plow, the cow, the fire, and the gun. I'm not gonna talk much about the, uh, the gun or the plow because it doesn't necessarily relate to this landscape, but the ax, the cow, and the fire are the way we manage these landscapes to continue to provide habitat for grassland birds. So let's start with fire. My favorite thing, I love, I'm a prescribed fire guy. I'm a, um, I love burning a prairie, love seeing the flush of wildflowers and green grass that comes up after it. Love watching the hawks hunt over the plume uh, and watch the quail run around and, and uh, 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 scratch in the ashes. Um, fire prescribed burning is something that can be done safely in, in nearly any environment uh, with the appropriate training and, and precautions. Um, what the fire does is it removes woody vegetation. Basically, it's re returning that historic process to these landscapes that the indigenous people learned through generations to use. Returns nutrients to the soil, stimulates growth of plants. Uh, it does, does so much. Uh, we need to get back in the practice of putting fire on our, on our prairies and our grasslands. Grazing plays a role. Grazing isn't appropriate everywhere. And I'm the first person to, to say that. Um, we need to think about those areas that were adapted to a grazing herbivore like the bison. Uh, in areas that are more mountainous, more droughty, further from water, um, many of our Southwestern rangelands aren't appropriate for livestock. And, and we just need to accept that. A lot of places where livestock are right now aren't appropriate for livestock. 41% um, of the country country's landmass is used for grazing. It's the single biggest land use. Um, and, and we need that. We need to, you know, provide that, that food for, for people, um, but we need to be smart about it too. Now, a lot of folks are concerned about public lands grazing, and they should be. And uh, we work a lot with um, uh, BLM and other agencies to try to make them, have, get them to do, make good choices. But it's worth pointing out that, um, it's raining here in New Mexico right now, which is really cool. Sorry, I couldn't help myself. Um, only 4% of the total beef production on American lands is uh, actually on public land. So it's a somewhat small part that we all, we tend to get caught up on a lot. Um, there are strategies for grazing that improve habitat for birds and the best ones are those that mimic the pattern of the, the bison. Now, Every um, rangeland professional, every grazing uh, manager has their own system and there's a million out there. There's the savory methods. There's, um, you know, just all sorts of uh, high intensity, low frequency grazing. My personal favorite, because it involves, incorporates burning into the, the rotation is a patch burn grazing. This is a system that's really popular in Oklahoma. Uh, groups like the Noble Foundation have put a lot of research into understanding this and showing that it works because it really does mimic the, the, the pattern of the bison. What we'll do is we'll burn an area. Uh, and as that uh, gets some spring rain and greens up, uh, we'll put some uh, cows on that fresh green grass, which is just what the bison would have done. They would have come into an area after green up and, and grazed it. 
and then we'll get them the heck out of there and allow that land to, to rest and to grow more grass uh, before coming back and burning it again three, four, five years down the line and letting them graze it again. That pattern uh, allows for, um, uh, it, it, it simulates the natural grazing of the bison, uh, but it also allows for patchiness and, and diversity in some areas that didn't quite burn and didn't quite get grazed that are still tall, still short. So you have a whole variety of, of different uh, cover types. When you have a variety of different vegetation and cover types, you have a variety of different birds, a variety of different insects, and that diversity is where the, that system gets its strength. In certain cases where we've removed grazing and fire, we've had brush and woody encroachment come in. So whether it's mesquite, um, creosote, uh, cedar, uh, juniper, similar to cedar, um, all these, these, there's wherever you are in the landscape, there's probably a tree that wants to live there. Uh, and if we remove the fire uh, that would have normally controlled it, uh, that, that woody encroachment is going to proliferate. So sometimes we need to use the axe to use Elder Leopold's term, uh, but in, in reality, what we're using these days is, uh, is, is herbicide. Now, this is this, if that concerns people, it should. Uh, we, you know, it's never ideal to go spray herbicide over a huge area. It has massive impacts and it can impact the, um, the microbiome of the soil as well, as well as just the, the, the trees that we're trying to control. Um, it's a necessary evil, in my opinion. Um, it's one of these cases where you gotta, uh, you know, break a, break a couple eggs to make an omelet. Uh, but we can't think of brush clearing in particular as a fix all in and of itself. Really brush clearing doesn't address the underlying drivers of poor habitat quality, which are quite often the removal of fire and the, uh, 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 the changing of the, the grazing regime. So this is sort of a sort of a remediation as opposed to a restoration, but one that's likely needed in a lot of these landscapes where fire has been removed and woody vegetation has moved in. And then as we use all these tools, we need to use them in an adaptive way. And so one of the things that we always work with landowners to do uh, is uh, have a plan in place and have a monitoring system so that plan can be adjusted and improved upon. Uh, adaptive management will allow you to understand your carrying capacity. There is only so many cows, only so many grazers that we can have in any one landscape. And we need to let the land tell us that. We don't, let, the land can't tell us that if we're not listening. Uh, we need to link management to those, to the outcomes. Uh, we need to change practices when we realize that they're not having those desired outcomes. And we need to be re monitoring results to be able to do that. There's a couple different ways we think about monitoring results. Some people just take the old take half, leave half, or, you know, a rancher will say halves for the cow, halves for the, the earth, um, using photo points, rainfall gauges, all these things to understand what the grazing pressure you're having on the land is, is important. So how do we put this into practice as Audubon? What are we doing to try to promote these practices and try to uh, restore these, these rangelands? Well, what we've realized is that, um, uh, the practices that I just mentioned for managing this landscape, they cost something, they're not for free. They either take labor, time, materials for these, land, for these ranchers, for these producers. Sometimes we need these producers to run less cattle, uh, which means uh, they're gonna make less money in some cases. And so we need to think about the economics. If we're gonna impact this industry, we're gonna do it for, in, a, in a financial way where the economics drive their decision-making. So realizing that, Audubon started the Audubon Conservation Ranching Program, which like I said earlier, is it's our bird-friendly beef program. Uh, it's an eco-label that allows the informed consumer to make a choice about conservation uh, with their pocketbook, to buy a product that they know is sustainably raised. So we create a market incentive for these ranchers to do these practices that are going to allow for a situation like this in the picture here, where you've got a grazing cow and a, I guess what is, it's either a sage, it's some kind of grass. Um, uh, and we do that um, by taking this market-based approach where we incentivize conservation beef, we empower consumers, we reward good practices, which is a puts us on a path to a more sustainable future. And we do that through certifying ranches. Uh, so each one of our ranches, I'll talk about a habitat management plan in a little bit, but they have a plan with specific bird objectives in it. We have willing retailers that advertise that uh, sell the value of this type of product 
and know how to sell that, that value. And then we have the consumers, like hopefully some of you um, that want to make the right choice with their purchases and they go and they uh, buy the, the product that is gonna you know, down the supply chain result in the most good. So everybody always has you know, skepticism about what we're requiring of these ranchers and that's good. That's what we need. We need eyes on this. We need folks keeping us, keeping us honest um, because the birds are gonna depend on it. So when we enroll a ranch, they have to follow certain protocols. Um, they have to manage the habitat first and foremost. So we have specific uh, needs that are identified based on the birds that we're trying to serve on that given ranch. And those habitat needs are translated into the management action. Sometimes it's, you know, leave this, you know, amount of standing grass over winter or, um, you know, rest this area, you know, X amount of time and, and rotate through for this amount of time. They're very, they can be very prescriptive uh, to help make sure that landowners have a guide to do the things they need to do for, for bird uh, habitat. We have rules around forage and feeding. We don't allow confined feeding. No beef that's served under, served under our label has spent any time in a feedlot, okay? Um, they are all free range grass fed uh, beef. Uh, we worry about animal health and welfare, obviously, make sure that all practices are humane and we have broader environmental sustainability goals like pesticide use and those type of things. The hey, rest Jen, of just a quick of this time area check for are, you that are it's these. 648. Um, and, uh, uh, there's different ones for different regions. This is specifically for the Chihuahuan Desert grasslands of southeastern New Mexico. Uh, but I can show a, a different list for the, um, uh, the Sonoran grasslands or the, um, uh, the tall grass prairie or short grass prairie, but we have a specific list of birds that are target based on their conservation status for each region. We work with the rancher to develop a plan. Okay, that plan's going to have uh, very pres prescriptive uh, 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 you know, instructions for when they you know, do disturbance, how long they allow for uh, recovery, uh, what areas are meant to provide habitat, how much native vegetation versus non-native, how much brush we want in the landscape. And we try to look at this and, and create patchiness and diversity among that landscape, but also healthy grass, uh, abundant forbs, all these things that we know drive a, a healthy situation. So far, this program's been a real success and we're excited about it. And we've got some, some big news just in the last week. Um, this fella here in the, uh, uh, the cowboy hat, it's Marshall Johnson. He's our program director, uh, lives and works up in the Dakotas, but he's overseen the growth of this program for the last couple of years. Uh, we're now up to over 100 participating ranches, uh, starting to near 3 million acres uh, enrolled in 13 different states. Um, there's uh, this number's probably changed, but last time I checked, 74 different restaurants, grocery stores, other outlets where you can you can purchase these project products. I'll start. I'll get, I want to give you a couple of those too. And so, um, if you go right now, this is where how I purchase our Audubon bird friendly beef. Um, this can be done from anywhere in the country. Uh, go to bluenestbeef.com, and you can actually subscribe for a beef box that gets delivered to your house. Mine comes every other month. Uh, it's the perfect amount. I'm actually married to a vegetarian, so I'm the only one that eats it. Um, uh, but it's uh, it's a great thing to have, um, uh, and uh, you can choose what's what comes in your box, and it's pretty. And then the big news most recently is we've brought on a new partner in uh, Panorama Organic Grass-Fed Meats. Now Panorama uh, is the biggest grass-fed beef brand in America. They sell it uh, Whole Foods in a number of states, uh, you know, specialty stores like Wegmans, but even in, you know, in, in Texas, they sell at Brookshire Brothers. Um, this was a big deal for us and it, and it almost doubled our acreage that was enrolled. This is just news that's come out in the last week. This Forbes article ran last week. So we're not at the point where you can actually purchase Audubon certified Panorama beef yet, uh, but you will be able to, and one day we'll, uh, hopefully we'll be able to tell you where they are located in a store near you. But if you want to buy bird friendly beef right now, um, I think the best place to go is to that Blue Nest Beef um, uh, uh, site. So I'm running out of time here and I wanna leave some uh, time for questions and I see like, it looks like we might've had some in the chat. Um, I don't wanna leave talking about grasslands without addressing some of the other issues though. And so I'm gonna click through some of these uh, and, and they might, be, might spark some conversation as well. So while we're working with grazing lands and thinking about landscape scale work, we need to think about those species that are most imperiled. 
Lester Prairie Chicken, a personal favorite of mine, uh, we have a listing decision that's pending. Our, our goal is to make sure that uh, science guides that listing decision and any subsequent plans. We need to make sure that the science backs up what we plan to do for this bird uh, because so far we haven't done enough. Uh, and in, by, when I say that, I mean critical habitat has to be expanded and has to be protected if this bird's going to survive in the landscape. Now, I know this is, you might not know the lesser prairie chicken, you might not know anything about this. I can give a whole talk on this, but I'm avoiding that. But I will show the population over the last couple of years. Um, for those of you that know this conversation, um, you'll hear some reports that the overall population has increased, but what's actually happened is one of the four subsets, one of the four subpopulations have increased and the other three have actually declined somewhat in the last 10 years. Um, so we uh, are going to be looking with the eagle eye and what the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service des decides to do on this bird. Um, if you want to learn more about the lesser prairie chicken, happy to talk about chickens anytime. We're also part of a, a big effort with a lot of different groups, industries, agencies, everybody, to create a central grasslands roadmap that'll provide a plan for working together across this vast landscape uh, to try to actually do collaborative conservation that can have impacts at scale. Uh, I'd encourage anybody that finds it, that in, topic interesting to go to the grasslandsroadmap.org and learn about what's going on. Um, uh, it was a process that was started virtually in this summer and we're going to get back up started up again uh, in the next year or so. We need to fund grassland conservation, okay? Uh, we need to invest. Uh, there's a lot of talk about infrastructure right now. I would make the case that our prairies and our grasslands are one of the most critical pieces of infrastructure this country has. It's what fed and and fueled this country for the letter uh, the last half century. Some ways we're doing that, Recovering America's Wildlife Act, uh, big funding from oil and gas royalties to states that would take federal legislation. There's been uh, a version of this passed in the House. Um, uh, and if you subscribe to our newsletter, we'll tell you when uh, you can call your uh, representative, call your legislator uh, to, to advocate for, for this bill and some of these others. 30 by 30, something that's getting a lot of buzz now, that's this proposal to protect 30% of America by 2030. Um, once again, legislation, if you sign on to our newsletter, we'll tell you when you can speak up and have your voice heard. There's some conversation brewing about a North American Grassland Conservation Act, much like the North American Waterfowl Conservation Act that I mentioned earlier, a major investment, a major policy change that would come with regulation as well as funding. Um, and then we need to make sure we're having non-game funding for our state wildlife agencies, fully funding our federal agencies with quite honestly haven't been funded since sequestration, you know, six, eight, 10 years ago, whenever that was. Um, they are bare bones right now. They can't conserve resources if we don't fund them. We need to make better siting decisions around things like oil and gas and renewable energy. In New Mexico, we just passed the Environmental Database Act, which uh, uh, Judy Kalman, our policy director, uh, 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 wrote. Um, and uh, uh, it allows for a centralized database for conservation uh, or for uh, project siting and planning. We need to do landscape level planning. We need to do um, uh, fix the, uh, the public land oil and gas leasing system. And so it actually takes into account more sensitive areas and species needs. And we need to do a better job of siting our renewable energy projects because even though they only make up 2% of the landscape in the Great Plains, uh, every little bit is hurting these birds and we need to conserve every, every bit we can. So that's actually all I've got. I know I talked fast and I did not leave as much time for questions as I had hoped, uh, but we covered a lot of ground. So uh, Katie, I will kick it back to you and I will stop sharing my screen. Thanks, John. Yeah, that was, that was a lot, um, but I hope everyone else learned as much as I did. There's always a lot in there. I think one of the things that stands out for me the most is, um, just the idea that grasslands are the biggest like carbon like capture, like that's, that just like never occurs, I think, to people. Um, the, we've gotten a couple of good questions in the chat um, just before, and I realize we're running up against the end of the hour. So if folks have to log off and eat dinner, you know, do human things, that's totally fine. Um, I'll just plug before we jump into the chat and that way people can put in some more questions. Um, to sign up for our newsletter if you want to hear about more upcoming events or like what John was saying about opportunities 
to act and you know engage with their local policymakers around things like citing decisions and policy that's coming through. Um, we also have um, our next webinar around climate change very appropriately next Thursday. So I'll put the link to register for that also in the chat um, and hope to see you guys join us um, for that Earth Day celebration. So uh, we had some really good questions. Are you ready? <laughs> I guess I will see. Okay, so a really great question from Ashley was, what sort of feedback have you received from participating ranchers? I'm interested in how the bird friendly ranching impacts ranchers income and livelihood compared to like other, you know, more industrial um, approaches that are not great for habitat. Yeah. Um, uh, so the, the feedback from ranchers that have participated has been really positive. So we've seen, you know, the results come across in different ways. It's still early days for this program, but in places where it's been on the ground longer in Missouri and that area is where it started, we have been able to document uh, pretty significant increases in target bird populations. So that's one outcome. We know that we know we can we can do that. Um, as far as the ranchers go, uh, almost every for a while, almost every rancher we were working with was a different system, who they sold their beef to, who didn't. Um, and, and so it was hard to compare apples to apples, but we're getting to the point where we're actually being able to see the financial outcomes of this. And we're finding that people are indeed able to charge a premium at retail for their for having this label on their their brand, which is the whole idea of the whole thing. So that satisfies them if they were able to make a little money. One of the big challenges of that is the supply chain. And so, um, you know, it's complex, once again, a whole talk in and of itself. Um, but uh, in those ranches where they are able to shorten the supply chain, sell directly to consumers, they tend to do better just in general, before our program even enters in, they tend to have a better bottom line. Our program further incentivizes that because it pushes them away from the industrial commodity beef feedlot system. And so we find them entering into more local uh, uh, supply chains, which actually allows them to keep more of the profit themselves. So, so far the, the outcomes have been good. And one of the things about this stuff too, is that when you, you know, do these more sustainable uh, practices when something like drought happens, you're ready to weather that drought because you haven't grazed all your grass down. And so over the long term, just doing these practices alone, even without the premium, can have uh, economic returns as well. That was, yeah. a, that was a hard uh, question to answer. Quick, <laughs> it, it was a good one, though. It was okay. a really good yeah, first was. question we got out of the chat. Yeah. Um, so good question, Ashley. Um, so Suzanne, who's from uh, Florida, is asking uh, how much of the grasslands are treated with phosphate-based fertilizers? I don't know if you know the answer. Um, Florida has a lot of the phosphate and they just had a big issue dumping a lot in Tampa Bay. Um, marine is obviously different than grasslands, but do you know if that's an issue for us? It, so in most of the Great Plains, it isn't, uh, well, in most grazing lands out here in the West, it isn't because most aren't, um, fertilizing those rangelands. When you go into like the more eastern grasslands where you do have some more pasture crops like uh, fescue and actually some of that southeast land, there's a lot of that, you are fertilizing those. Here you're not fertilizing it as much. I think the bigger, a, a similar problem that is more relevant out here is pesticide use, is in particular neonicotinoid pesticides, which is the most common class use uh, that not only, you know, are, are decimating our insect populations, but in turn, either by lo losing the insect as their food base or having direct toxicity is causing bird loss too. Uh, and so I would say pesticides more than, um, uh, more than the, the phosphate fertilizers, but as you get into the farmland of the East and Iowa and obviously all that, you know, the amount of phosphates that are pumping into the Mississippi River, flowing down into the Gulf of Mexico, causing that dead zone outside of the Mississippi Delta uh, is a huge issue, just not necessarily the one we're, one of the ones we're talking about out here. Interesting. Um, so if anyone else has more questions, feel free to put them in the chat. We did have several interests about prairie chickens. I don't know if you want to talk about prairie chickens. <laughs> um, and, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll save that talk for when we get a, a listing decision and we need to get you guys riled up to advocate for the chicken uh, uh, with us. But maybe that's for another day, another webinar. 
All right. Well, Sarah Wood wants an entire webinar just on prairie chickens. <laughs> I would love that, Sarah. We will we will find a time to do that for sure. Great. Well, does anybody else have any questions for John? Or we can you can even just unmute and ask him yourself if you'd like. Or you can let me off the hook. That's nice. All right. It sounds like it, the, the deafening silence of Zoom means it's time for dinner. We're getting a lot of thanks in the chat. Thank you guys so much for joining us this evening. Um, we really enjoyed having everyone here. I hope you learned something. We will be posting this recording on YouTube. Um, and I'll send out uh, an email um, probably later this week since it'll take us a little while to upload. Um, and it'll have the recording, probably a, maybe a copy of John's slides, and maybe some other resources that we can share with everyone. So thanks for joining us. Have a good night.